what's up? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Tuesday, December 8th, 2020. I'm one of your hosts, Blessing, Addy Oye Jr. Joining me is Imran, the Don Khan. How you doing, Blessing? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I was prepared this week to take over the show, if need be, because I figured you would be in, like, a cyberpunk-like hole. Like, you would just oh not God. be... You would not be... No, no offense to you at all, but I can't imagine a human taking over shows after playing a game for like the entire week. It's been a, it's been a fun, but also somewhat stressful week because I was, <laughs> I was thinking about this literally this morning as I was prepping shows. I was like, man, I feel like I've aged a little bit since yesterday because <laughs> like, you know, you play I, I'm 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 playing Cyberpunk nonstop last week, finish it review it and then i think what i didn't i didn't necessarily anticipate was all the content that would come immediately after me reviewing it on sunday mm-hmm. to where cool kfgd we are ta- we are talking about the review roundup and then going to ps love you i am answering uh, uh questions and then aside from that right like i'm on twitter following what the coverage is and seeing what other people have to say about it and seeing people react to what i'm saying about it and all this stuff and it's like it's been this fun slash somewhat stressful uh process of getting slash giving all this information but it has also been like somewhat satisfying like i think this is the the biggest um uh instance so far since i've gotten hired by kind of funny where i am covering a game like this and it is one of the biggest games of the year right like the only one the only other one i can point to is the last is part two and thankfully for that one we had pretty much all of us play it you know during that review cycle and so i wasn't alone having to like carry the flag for this game on the channel um mm. But that said, like it's been it's been a pretty uh, satisfying experience, I'll say. Doing yeah. it this time around with Cyberpunk, it's, really, really quick with the aging thing, blessing the beard isn't helping. I'll say, you know, you, you oh, do that's true with the beard. Yeah, that is true, and that is actually helpful uh, because as I, I Kevin keeps making fun of me for this during, whenever, whenever we play Fortnite now because it was a few weeks ago where we're we're having a conversation about like I'm 26, right, and like I feel like people perceive me as younger. And I made the comparison that I never should have made and that Kevin won't let go. I was like, but like, if you look around at the industry, like, right, like I'm the same age as Lana Pierce, to which Kevin immediately was like, yeah, but Lana Pierce way more successful. And I was not making that comparison. <laughs> well, Kevin, no, though, his first keeps thing taking was it like, there. His first thing was like, no, she's much older than you. And then he like was starting to question all of our ages because he was very confused by how old all of we all of we are. <laughs> I think Kevin just doesn't have a concept of age. I don't think Kevin understands like. Once you get past like twenty five, it just doesn't matter anymore. Like, yeah, Greg is technically younger or older than me, but I, for some reason, I always perceive us as the same age. But it's only like a two, like a two year difference or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's not like it's not like Nick, where we all see Nick and we're like, that man is seventy years old. Yeah, he's a Nick fossil. Is a skeleton. He's still making content. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's so Nick true. is like what happens after you open the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, enough about Nick. Let's talk about. Ghost of Tsushima winning big, uh, a warning about Cyberpunk 2077 and more because this is Kind of Funny Games Daily each and every weekday at 10 a.m. live right here on twitch.tv slash Kind of Funny Games. We run you through the nerdy news you need to know about. If you're watching live, you can correct us when we get stuff wrong by going to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. If you don't want to watch live, you can watch later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames, roosteeth.com, or you can listen later on podcast services around the globe by searching for Kind of Funny Games Daily. To be a part of the show, at to patreon.com slash kind of funny games or bronze members or above get to write in and silver members or above get the show ad free with the exclusive daily post show housekeeping for you. PS, I love you. XOXO is up right now. And as I said earlier, it's us talking about all your cyberpunk questions. I answer as many of them as possible. and I try to give as succinct uh, and uh, yet detailed answers as I can. And so hopefully I know, I know I know coming out of that episode, people are still gonna have more questions, but thankfully that's what uh next week's games cast is for. Because next week is gonna be us talking about Cyberpunk as a group because more of us will have our hands on it. Uh and so expect more cyberpunk content even to come. Speaking of, uh, if you're watching live on Twitch right uh, right now, right after KFGD, Greg and Snowbike Mike are going to be doing a fun Halo slash Butterfinger sponsored stream. So stay tuned for that. I know what you're thinking. What does that have to do with Cyberpunk? Well, speaking of streams, Andy is going to be streaming Cyberpunk 2077, showing off ray tracing and all that goodness on his NVIDIA RTX 3080. And that's happening first on Thursday, December 10th from 1 to 3 p.m. Pacific time. And then again on Tuesday, December 15th, from 11 a.m. 1 p.m. Uh, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific time on Twitch.tv/slash Kind of Funny Games. 
And I know you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of information. That's a lot of content being made. It doesn't stop there. Game Awards are happening this week, and we're watching along uh, on Thursday live. That's starting at 4 p.m. Pacific time, and that's going down once again right here on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games. And you're going to be joining us for that, right? Yeah. I realized it was four hours when I volunteered for that, so <laughs> that's going to be fun. Yeah, strap in. That's going to be a great. I feel I, four hours the, is excessive, man. <laughs> but like, it's a, it's, it's an award show. It's so like we can chill. I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna no, grab some not. drinks. Gonna it's kind of an award. It's, 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 some it's or, somewhat of uh, an award show. Yeah. It's it's Jeff Keighley's big streaming party with some awards being given out and a lot of the trailers and marketing in some weeks. And probably Stick Hydro Man is going to make an appearance. <laughs> it's going to be a good time. Uh, I out of all the 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 watch alongs that we've been doing this year with the whole summer games mess and all that stuff, I think this is the one I I am looking forward to most because this is going to be the one where it's like, all right, yeah, like we get, we're getting the announcements, we're getting the awards, we're getting Jeff Keeley being Jeff Keeley, we're going to get Joseph Ferris. Like, what's not to look forward to here? Did we ever do like predictions, or did we just like predictions of the actual announcements? I don't think we got to that. I think we were supposed to do that during this last games cast, but I think it was Maybe going long. We didn't get there. Do you have, have any predictions for announcements? I have a couple. Maybe you got? maybe that's a thing we should seal the envelope to actually. Well, uh, we'll we'll figure Ooh, it out later. Like yeah, like do a seal. I mean, we have and then like reveal after the show like what what y'all predicted. We have two days. Like I don't know. I don't think we're gonna have the chance to because we don't have a games cast because games cast was cyberpunk. We'll do it for the pre-show, you know. Do it for the pre-show hmm. on uh, hmm. on Thursday. I want. I want Imran to to divulge his secrets because, like, between that, between now and then, more things are going to leak, and so yeah. some of those predictions might get ruined. We can talk off air or in a post show. We'll see. Okay, a post we'll show see. doesn't get revealed until after, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, thank you to our Patreon producers, our producer uh, Blackjack. Today we're brought to you by Quip Trojan and BetterHelp. But I'll tell you about that later. For now, let's begin with what is and forever will be. The Roper Report. It's time for some news. We have six stories today. A baker's dozen. Starting with our number one, speaking of the Game Awards, Ghost of Tsushima wins Player's Voice Award at the Game Awards. This is from Wesley LeBlanc at IGN. Jeff Keighley has revealed that Ghost of Tsushima is the Game, Game Awards Player's Voice Award winner this year after three rounds of voting from fans. The Game Awards will take place on December 10th, and it's there that awards like Best Narrative, Best Direction, and of course, Game of the Year will be announced. These awards are voted on by both a curated voting jury and fans, but in those instances, the voting jury accounts for 90% of the vote, while the fan votes account for the other 10%. That's not the case for the Player's Voice Award, which is is entirely decided upon by fans. There's no vote weighing weighing involved with with this award, so Ghost of Tsushima is the game that got the most total votes out of all the other nominees. It beat out other 2020 releases like The Last of Us Part II, Hades, and Doom Eternal. Ghost of Tsushima saw its placement in the rankings shift each round. It had, a, it had a 3% lead over The Last of Us Part II during the second round of voting, 14% and 11% of the votes, respectively. And then when the, fr- when the final round began on December 6th, The Last of Us Part II climbed to 43% of the vote, while Ghost of Tsushima only had 31%. Then, with just four hours to go before, before the closing of the votes, Ghost of Tsushima jumped up to 47%, and The Last of Us Part II dropped to 33%. That was the last update Keeley gave to gave of the voting percentages before announcing Tuesday that Ghost of Tsushima is the Player's Voice Award winner of the Game Awards this year. Imran, does this surprise you? Trending that direction, I like we were talking about this a bit about that games cast we were talking about earlier, where we were predicting the awards. And one of the things I said is, Last of Us is divisive, but it's not divisive among critics. It is divisive among fans. So. I, I'm not shocked that like people rallied around Ghost of Tsushima. There's a little bit of campaigning going along with stuff like this too. Like I saw Sucker, Bunk, Sucker Punch out there on Twitter, like saying like, "Hey, vote for Ghost of Tsushima," and like they were doing it pretty consistently. I saw some of Neil Druckmann saying, "Hey, vote for Last of Us too," but not nearly as much, and hmm. not as many people. Like I said, Last of Us Two is divisive, so I I'm not shocked that Ghost of Tsushima won. I'm sh- well, I'm not shocked that Ghost of Tsushima beat Last of Us. I am a little surprised that it beat it by that much. And like that quickly too, because it was like, it seemed like in the last like hours of like how much it jumped between, it was like a 14% difference, right? And then it like yeah. jumped 14% the, last four hours the had that, other way. That big old know? jump. Yeah, that that's the surprising part for me. Do like, you think in our, in our Gamescast Game of the Year predictions, 
I think none of us really predicted Ghost of Tsushima for overall game of the year. Do you think we're underestimating its power? Absolutely. If anything, last year showed us that all of us, except for Fran, were just, we have no idea how game of the year is going to be voted. Apparently, Fran is, we should have asked Fran what his, he thinks this year is going to win. So, like, we can ignore it and then feel wrong afterwards. <laughs> and then, yeah, <laughs> be proven wrong. But, yeah, like, I, I do feel like we're ignoring a little bit. I would not be shocked if players voice a little different because I, that jump to me says that there was an organization on some subreddit or some, or some Discord that was like, hey, go in, go now and vote for it. I don't know like what the total number of votes were, if it was like 1,000 or 30,000. But yeah, it, it clearly shows that fans really like Ghost of Tsushima, and Ghost of Tsushima fans especially like Ghost of Tsushima. So if, depending on how much voting is weighted against critic voting in the game of the year, like if all the votes are evenly split and player votes are what put it, puts it over, then Ghost has a really good chance. I got a question here. Speaking of, from Connor Kilmurray, who writes into patreon.com slash kind of funny games, just like you can, and says, Hey, KFGD crew, with Ghost of Tsushima winning the Game, Game Awards Players Voice Award, I'm reminded of the different experiences game media folks had and then general players had with the game. The initial reviews were solid to pretty great, and the reception post launch felt way bigger than most people predicted. Do you guys credit? Credit that to Ghost being a dark horse game uh, this year, or are the bubbles of media and non-media just getting further apart? Thanks for the insight in Game Daily. Yes, I think there's some degree of that. I think uh, Days Gone is a good example of a game that, critically, not that well liked. In fact, kind of, I'm not gonna say despised anyway. It's generally it was considered a mediocre game in yeah. reviews. Critics like very very much write that game off as like yeah, it was it's whatever. It's not. It doesn't uh, live up. But among fans, it's huge. Like, it has a swell of support. And, like, it was enough to get Sony Ben to, you know, do a, not a PS5 version, but a, a fairly big PS5 update. I, I suspect that is some degree of what's happening with Ghost of Tsushima. I, Ghost of Tsushima is a much better game. It's in my top 10. But I don't, I think there are some, there's a distance between critics and fans on what makes a good game. And for yes. a lot of people, it's like, I enjoy a lot of the, what is considered like meandering or collectathon kind of stuff or like open world uh, tropes that like enhance the value of a game, but don't necessarily make a game better for a reviewer. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of that going on where what I think of. When when I think of how critics view games and critics talk about games and how people uh, either pick things apart or or lift things to the top, I think there's a Ghost of Tsushima is an interesting example of this is a game that is very comfortable. Like Ghost of Tsushima, yeah. I don't think does anything that is revolutionary by any standard. Like it is a very much it is very much a standard open world game with pretty standard combat with a good story and uh, uh, like a beautiful open world and it is taking a lot of elements that I think are proven and putting them together in a way that is solid and in a way that I think for fans, you come into it and you're like, oh yeah, this is a, this is a great game. Like this is the, this game did it. Like it came out and it was polished and it was good and it has all the things that I want out of this type of game. Whereas I could see on the critic side, folks playing it being like, well, this does nothing new. This does nothing. This doesn't yeah. reinvent the real wheel in any sort of way. Where, especially coming off of a game like The Last of Us Part Two, which even though divisive among, amongst fans. I, you could at least say went for it in in certain different ways that felt either you know dynamic and new decisions. and cool or they made definite decisions of that they game. made decisions <laughs> in a way yeah. where Ghost of Shima you know didn't make as big of decisions in ter in terms of the direction and in terms of big story moments and all this stuff but in a way that Ghost of Shima overall succeeded because it's an awesome game like. I think critics weigh ambition much higher than uh, fans yes. necessarily do, which is not like an indictment of any sort of game. It's like Ghost of Tsushima did exactly what it set out to do. I think Immortal of Phoenix Rising is another example of that. You and I both fell off that game pretty hard. Like we yes. played it, it was like, all right, this is we know what this game is doing. It's not really that interesting to us. But I peeked in on some discussion of it yesterday, and people who like that game will really love it. Like they're saying, this is exactly what I wanted. And for me, it's it is. It's ex I, I'm pretty sure they knew what kind of game they were making, but for me, it's like, well, this isn't, this is not the the evolution of Breath of the Wild that I wanted, so I'm not interested. But for everyone else, it's like, well, this is just, this is the game that they said they were making, so cool, this is fun. 
Yeah. And I'm right there. I'm right there with you too. Like even, even seeing discussions on my Twitter timeline from folks who have gotten to the Phoenix rising after the fact, uh, it's been fun seeing people be like, well, this game is awesome. Like I'm, I'm, I'm really digging this thing. And even as I was talking, as I've been talking about the game on podcasts and stuff, and as I was playing the game pre-release, you know, I kept having the thought of people are really going to like, people are going to like this game. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm playing this game and I am pretty much, I'm pretty bored by it yeah. and it is, do- it is doing nothing for me, but I see all the parts in this game and how they're coming together. And there are going to be people that absolutely adore this game and are very confused why critics aren't loving it or not even <laughs> yeah. confused, but are like, I just disagree with the critics, which I think is, Oh, it's, a, it's an awesome thing, right? Like that's, that's how all this stuff works in terms of opinions and stuff. Yeah. It's all, it's uh, all about taste and stuff. Cause yeah, I was, I was yeah. in a similar boat where it was like, cause I think a lot of people think I, think uh immortals is like a bad game and it's like while this point i was like this isn't a bad game and i know people are gonna like this it's just like it's not hitting for me it is generic to me and stuff like yeah. that yeah so exactly so do you think what are the chances now do you th- for you do the to the do the chances rise in terms of ghost stream and taking it all because like i still don't I think my prediction for it during Gamescast was Hades taking taking it all with Last of Us, Last of Us Part Two being the other option uh, and probably being the more likely option. But I'm going Hades because I'm a I'm a I'm a hipster who's uh, <laughs> trying to like get points away from people. Um, but Ghost of Tsushima, where do you think it stands as far as like the its overall chances in Game of the Year? I think it is that dark horse candidate. It is going to be the thing of like if this wins, all of us will be shocked because. Just mm. like, regardless of how you think about that game, that game is in all like very highfalutin company. It is yeah. among like Hades and Last of Us Two and FS7 Remake and all that. Yeah, and I can see, yeah, I could see all of those games. An argument for Game of the Year. It's harder for me to see that with Ghost of Tsushima over those. But th- that said, like that doesn't. I I made it. I made the argument earlier. If everything else the vote splits and hit, the player voice puts it over the top. Because like it does weigh a little on uh, yeah, it's game like of the a small year. Percentage. Yeah, it's like yeah. 10%. If, like if that puts it over the top, then that would not be sh- surprising. My, and also, like a samurai game won last year, so maybe yeah. one wins this year. People, my, people love samurai. My crazy prediction is this is going to be like a very akin to the year with like La La Land and Moonlight. Not with the mm-hmm. whole like uh, one gets you right think out. They're going to fuck up like, the games. No, 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 no. <laughs> but like, like I, I'm pretty sure what is happened. Eternal. Our Correct, bad. Correct, Ghost me, Ghost me, correct me if I'm wrong, but like La La Land still like swept that year, but it was Moonlight that got like the the best picture. I, yeah. I feel like it, it, there might be something similar where like Hades cleans up, but the Last of Us Part Two still wins Game of the Year. I think it's going to be the thing that. of like best direction goes to Last of Us Two and best game goes to Hades. Or Game of the Year goes, mm. goes to Hades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that's my prediction, and we'll we'll see. I am the the closer and closer we get to it, the less and less I am feeling confident in my Hades pick for Game of the Year, <laughs> just because like I. It was Greg who put out the poll. I think during the during the recording of the episode, asking people like, "What is game of the year?" I think mo- way, Last of Us Part Two won that by a mile. And part of that is, I think it, our audience is very much PlayStation leaning and is going to like the Last of Us um, over a lot of a other poll games. But... Saying like, "Do you want PS Five or breathing?" And people would choose PS Five. Exactly. Like, like, like that. That's that's the thing you definitely have to take into account. But. Last among among critics, Last of Us is so beloved, especially now. And I, I think what is pushing it even more so now for me is seeing Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven reviews and seeing how all over the place that is for a game that I think overall I think people would would agree is like, oh yeah, this is like ambitious and this is doing it's doing a bunch of different things that are super awesome. Uh, but among critics, you can see where those things start to lie in in the numbered scores versus Last of Us Part Two, which I think across the board uh, blew people away. Critically, we shall see. Yeah. I'm not super confident it's going to be Hades. Like, if it's, if it's Last of Us 2, I'm not going to, like, throw my mouse across the room or anything. But, like... Yeah. I mean, personally, I would pick Last of Us Part 2 over Hades. I wouldn't. But I... I just... I think I'm... I'm gaming for it to be surprising. So, if it's mm-hmm. Hades, then I'm... Like, that's what I'm... A little bit of me is hoping for that. Because, like, it would be cool and interesting for an indie game that, you know... It's explicitly not crunch and early access and just sort of came out like out of nowhere yeah. like did everything though, right yeah if that wins game of the year over a bunch of games that probably like that were game of the year bait a little bit mm-hmm. we'll see we shall see 
Story number two, I got a PSA. Speaking of Cyberpunk, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 features epileptic triggers. This is from Marie de Alessandri at GamesIndustry.biz. CD Projekt Red's highly, highly awaited title, Cyberpunk 2077, features epileptic triggers, Game Informer warned. In a PSA published yesterday, the publication's associate editor, uh, Liana Rupert, reported use of red and blue glitch effects, as well as rapid white and red blinking LEDs in the game, which can be a trigger for epileptic players like herself. Quote, a common trigger for epileptics in media are rapid blinking lights, specifically of the red and white variety, Rupert explained. During my time with Cyberpunk 2077, I suffered one major seizure and felt several moments where I was close to another one, end quote. The main issue occurs during brain dances, she reported, an in-game feature that sees the player use virtual reality to get immersed in memories. Quote, pretty much everything about this is a trigger, and this is something that caused me to have a grand mal seizure when playing. The brain dance headset fits over both eyes and features a rapid onslaught of white and red blinking LEDs, much like the actual device neuro neurologists use in real life to trigger a seizure when they need to trigger one for diagno diagnosis purposes, end quote. Rupert noted that these sections can't be skipped as they're part of the main story and recommended vulnerable players to look away or close their eyes when the brain dance sections occur or have a quote gamer backup buddy uh, nearby to help them through. Uh, for me to add to this, right, like me and during PSLVXOXO yesterday, uh, me and Greg looked through or I looked through uh, some of the options in the game to see what accessibility stuff was because uh, somebody wrote in with questions about accessibility. And it seems like there's no option to turn that off either. Like there's not really any way to skip that really surprises me that a game in development this long did not have an accessibility expert like or somebody consulting on it to say like hey yeah you can't do that if only because that is a part of cert like sony mm -hmm. and microsoft look at those things to see like hey you can't trigger seizure like they've had that in since like 2002 or something i to me that says that i've been how do I put this? Cert is not always necessary. Cert is a thing that some publishers or hyped games that need to get through uh, through cert or through to a certain date, released on that date, can say like, "Hey, no, we're going to fix everything. We're going to make sure everything works on cert. Don't worry about it." This is not an official policy. This kind of just occasionally gets through. I know of a I know of maybe one or two examples in the entire time I've ever been covering video games that have done it. Mm -hmm. This to me sounds like it's one of those examples because there's no way, there is just no way in hell that this got through both Sony and Microsoft that someone's saying, hey, no, you need to at least dim the screen here because this isn't going to work. I'm, yeah. I I suspect that's what they're going to do. It, like they'll probably issue a patch today or something and say like, okay, this part is the screen is dimmed or we've like removed some lights or whatever. Yeah. I got a question here from Sapphire Diamond Ruby who writes in and says, morning KFGD. Do you think CD Projekt Red will make a public statement about the epileptic concerns people rightfully have about the game? Considering how active they are on the marketing side of promoting Cyberpunk, do you think we'll get anything from them about these issues? Have a great Tuesday. I saw at the end of the Game Informer, or not the Game Informer uh, PSA, the uh, GamesIndustry.biz article, they mentioned that they reached out to uh, CD Projekt Red for comment and it seemed like CD Projekt Red had not gotten back to them yet. Yeah. Uh, they better. I imagine like, they will get a is, fix. In part in place before they make an announcement, but yeah, yeah, and like, and, and that's the thing, right? I feel like this is one of those things where this feels this this feels so urgent to take care of. Like, I'm I'm with you that I don't know how this makes it past cert. I don't know how this makes it. Past, I don't know how there's not somebody at CD Projekt Red who's able to point this out right in the process and be like, oh no, this is gonna fuck people up because it's not even like a side quest thing where three percent of players are going to even encounter this quest and so like somehow insert because the game is so massive right no nobody put two and two together that this would be a thing that would need to be fixed this is a thing that's from the that this brain dances are a part of the main campaign and you encounter them multiple times in the main campaign and so there's no reason for uh this to be a thing that is missed from a game that is one so highly anticipated and two from a studio that is as that 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 has as much resources and production behind it as CD Projekt Red. Like I don't know how this happens, and so yeah. I think for them, yeah, I to cover their asses, I could see them putting putting out the fix before putting out a statement. But either way, this shit needs to be fixed as soon as possible. They, I I expect they will have to respond to it because the Game Informer story does say like, hey, this is intentionally designed to cause seizures, which. One that that shouldn't say that that is that is a bad thing to say from a journalistic standpoint. Of uh, you can't assign intention 
to them. So they have to come out and say like, hey, no, this we made a mistake. This is not intent. We're not trying to intentionally give people seizures. That is not like the the focus here. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you ever watched um, Incredibles 2? Yes. Well, I watched most of it because I so he <laughs> has a thing about very falling well. asleep in fucking theaters <laughs> in any movie. It could be Incredibles 2, which was great. It could be the second My Hero Academia movie that we saw early. That was this year, by the way, Bless. I that have was this such a year. Problem. Not a great movie, but yes. I have oh, such a problem. Come Wait, on. you didn't like the My Hero movie? I do. I, I, I like most of it up until the awesome. up until the end where they like do that thing and then they like, oh yeah, just nobody remembers it now. I'm like it's an anime I don't know. movie. Like, <laughs> yeah, the way they write you out of it is dumb they write themselves into a corner but that moment is hype as fuck imran come on come on it is hype as fuck but it's an anime movie you don't need to place it in canon i've never needed an excuse no, absolutely. for like, Naruto like to meet uh, somebody hear me out here like uh, neither of the movies are uh, really needed in canon they're just fun little side stories you know yes i know i'm just saying like they're not needed in canon you don't need to explain it away explaining it away makes the the whole thing worse Anyways, you know Blessing gonna, falls asleep in they're theaters. Gonna do, they're going to do the same thing in My Hero 3. In that, in that okay. movie too. That's yes, what they, they sure. love to do that. Um, but back to the original point, yes. A, I have a problem falling asleep in movies, yes. And so I watched Incredibles 2, but I, there's like, there's definitely a 20-minute gap. I, the, I know the, what scene you're talking about, Imran, where, where okay. uh, uh, Elastigirl is about to close in on what she thinks is the villain, and there's that like villain layer. Yes, yeah. and there's like a a very strobe light scene there mm-hmm. of like constant flashing. Lights. And I don't, and they like, didn't I, give a warning at first. I think they yeah. might have put one in like after people started uh, talking right. about it. But yeah, that like, they first did, but weekend. they like didn't dim the scene or anything. Like they put it like a a sign in movie theaters, like hey, this this game, our movie has a scene like this. I like that's that's an example. I, the biggest studio in the world, our biggest company in the world, can't make a or wouldn't remove that thing and didn't see that. Like somehow they didn't think, oh, this is going to cause a problem. So mm-hmm. I'm not shocked necessarily that CD Projekt Red didn't, but at some point they should have gotten an accessibility expert to like go through that game, or that should have gone through CERT and somebody tell them. There, I'm. I think it's exceedingly unlikely that accessibility experts Sony, CERT, and Microsoft CERT all failed to do this. Mm-hmm. So the question is, how many end runs around very basic things did CD Projekt take? And that's a very valid question. They probably need to answer. And we, will, we shall see how those console versions of Cyberpunk 2077 pan out because Oof. there are a lot. There's, there's a lot of, around that conversation around where codes are at and all, and all that stuff that is still like, all right, we shall see because things are not looking great for those, for those versions. But fingers crossed, they come out and that day one patch. Who knows? Blessing. Who knows? That day one patch might fix everything. We shall it's see. Not gonna, there's so many <laughs> based on what people have described and based on what you described. I don't see a patch fixing all that you would need to basically have, re-download the entire I mean, game the patch is like what 50 gigabytes something like that I, I've, I've seen that number floating around like again not gonna fix everything because there's a lot <laughs> in there that like needs to be taken care of but uh, we shall see. see we'll see who knows we'll see uh story number three persona 5 strikers has officially been announced this is michael hyam at GameSpot. uh after last week uh, or after a, a leak last week that revealed its Western launch date and trailer, Persona 5 Strikers has been officially announced and its February 2021 release date has been confirmed. The game is a continuation of the story that concluded in the original Persona 5 and sees the return of its cast of characters in the Phantom Thieves, along with some new faces. It's also an action RPG Musou-style take on the traditional Persona form- formula as it's being developed by Omega Force, the studio behind the Dynasty Warriors games and several other adaptations such as Fire Emblem Warriors and and Hyrule Warriors. For Persona 5 Strikers maintains its party-based dynamic in combat and elemental affinities, along with some of uh, some Persona trademarks like all-out attacks, Persona abilities, spell casting, and its lavish art style. Like the original RPG, Strikers will include Japanese and English VO uh, with the return of the original voice casts. Two versions of the games will be available. Uh, the Digital Deluxe Edition gives players early access to the full version of the game on February 19th, 2021, while the Standard Edition launches on February 23rd, 2021. Along with getting to Along with getting to play the game four days early, the digital deluxe version comes with bonus content like a digital art book, the soundtrack with over 40 songs, behind-the-scenes videos, Persona Legacy soundtracks for the game, uh, being Persona 1 through 4 Golden, uh, and in-game items. Physical versions from GameSpot or GameStop uh, include a pin and, and steelbook copies. Copies will be available at Best Buy for the Switch version. Get hype, Imran. It's happening. It's coming. Get hype. It's official. Yeah, 
this is very clearly supposed to be a game awards announcement, but very cool clearly. That they, yeah, cool that, cool that they're finally doing it. It it's a weird to me. It took a year. Like I guess not that weird because it's all mm-hmm. like Sega localization has probably been focusing on I guess Rim and uh, which is also quite good by the way. I've been playing that recently. Uh, and I need to play more. Like I'm I'm still like in the tutorial. It's been like three hours, but it is a the story is really really good in that game. And the art style is amazing. Yes. I am blown away by how good the art style is and how good the UI is in that game. I got to get yeah, back I, to it. I'm still waiting for whatever the answer to that naked teens thing is because everyone's like, oh, yeah, the actual answer, the reason for that is good. But we'll, Do we'll they see. breathe through their skin? Is that what I, that, that was a joke I made originally because, I like, will I be uh, ashamed of my words and deeds when I find out? But we'll see how it actually turns out. The, this is like, 13 Sentinels, right? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. But yeah, so far I'm really I'm really digging that game story. But anyway, yeah, I I imagine those two get that and Yakuza were the uh, prior, priorities. Uh, priorities. And by the mm-hmm. time this game is probably ready, Hyrule Warriors is probably be coming out, and like you can't release those two games next to each other. So yeah, just had to wait till February. Yeah, like this was like we've talked about this plenty before, but usually like Persona games will launch in uh, Japan first and then come to the West like uh, roughly five to six months later. Um, so yeah, this uh, had the makings of being out already in the West, but yeah, I, I, I think what you just said, like makes sense of why they would push it for a bunch of different reasons, possi- probably some COVID reasons as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah spread, so. spread out the persona love, right? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm down with the idea of us getting persona five Royal this year and then us waiting a year and then getting persona Scr- or persona strikers. Cause like, which a lot of people have been tweeting at me that they've been confused. They're like, it's not a soccer game. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, because like Mario Strikers, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to cool. I would, game. I would play a Persona soccer game. Same. Who would be your, who would be your, uh, your striker? Like Ryuji, because he's, board. he's, the, he's the sporty boy. Yeah, he's my Ryuji sporty does, himbo. Ryuji Come does on. have striker energy. <laughs> if it's only Persona player. Five strikers, then yes, Ryuji. If we're going like all, most Personas, I'd probably go uh, Koromaru, the dog. I'll probably go uh, Kanji is the dude from Persona 4, right? Like the yes. like the, the biker guy, yeah. biker dude. Yeah. yeah, I feel like he'd be a good forward to have. Goalkeeper, I'd go um, uh, Makoto. I feel like Makoto would be a yeah, great goalkeeper. Yeah, that's what I was oh, thinking yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, she has goalkeeper energy. <laughs> All right, I got three news stories that I want to uh, quick fire. But before I do, I want to tell you about our sponsor. Of course, you can go to patreon.com slash kind of funny games where you can get the show ad free. And speaking of ads, this episode of kind of funny games daily is brought to you by quip. There are only two types of people in this world. Those of us who brush and floss every day and those who might just start thanks to quips, new refillable floss pick, you know, quip the electric toothbrush you hear about all the time, but it's their sleek reusable floss pick. You'll want to use next. The durable handle is easy to guide restrings with a click and comes with a compact mirror dispensing case for on the go. Pair your floss with the with the perfect electric toothbrush for adults and kids. Quip has simple guiding features you need, like time sonic vibrations with guiding pulses to help you brush better. You can personalize your routine with over nine premium brush colors, plus anti-cavity toothpaste for every taste in mint and watermelon. And now you can get amazing rewards just for brushing your teeth better every day. Quip smart electric toothbrushes connect to the to the free Quip app so you can earn amazing awards like free products and discounts. Quip also delivers brush heads, floss, and toothpaste refills every three months from $5. Shipping is free so you can save money and skip the store. Bring the delight uh, bring delight to your everyday brushing and join over 5 million mouths brushing with Quip, starting at $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash games right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash games, spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash games. Quip, better oral health. Uh, made simple. Before I get to the ne- to this next ad, I need to take a swig. <laughs> you want to be well lubed up for this one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Imran knows. We're also brought to you by Trojan Tantrix Pleasure Sleeve. While your hand gets it done, and frankly, it's always going to be there, there's a new and, dare we say, more exciting way to masturbate. Introducing Trojan Tantrix, the new sex toy for the boys. The new Trojan Tantrix Pleasure Sleeve is a handheld, soft, textured sheet, like really, really soft. Tantrix is designed to enhance the sensation of each stroke with textured ridges for max pleasure. Since it fits in your hand, you already know how to use it. You just do what you would normally do. You, <laughs> you have, you have full range of motion, so you can adjust your grip. Plus, like, your hand during this ad read is like, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you doing that? <laughs> you get- <laughs> 
it helps me focus. Uh, uh, you have full range of motion, so you can adjust your grip and pressure to stimulate where you want. Use with a water-based lube. Use Tantrix for solo pleasure to take pleasure into your own hands or spice up the elusive hand job and use it with your partner. Tim has used Tantrix and says it really helps him get the job done. With Trojan Tantrix, there's a better way to do it. So head to Amazon, Walmart, or, or Walmart.com and make masturbation so much more. We're also brought to you by BetterHelp. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally av available in many areas. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor you'll get timely and thoughtful responses plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as as with traditional therapy BetterHelp is committed to facil facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily visit betterhelp.com slash games that's better h-e-l-p and join over one million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of a professional or of an experienced professional special offer for kind of funny games daily listeners get 10 percent off your first month at betterhelp.com slash games all these ads are about self-care they really are. You got to love it. Take care of yourself, everybody, by any means necessary. Story number four, Forza Horizon 4 has a new free mode. Uh, this is from Luke Riley at IGN. And, and uh, Barrett, I have a trailer dude, that you can play in the dude, background as I read through. You never need to tell me. I'm on, I'm on the up and up. <laughs> I, I, I got to remember that that Barrett isn't Kevin. You know, Barrett, Barrett, Barrett I pay attention, knows. okay? Barrett I'm not over <laughs> here petting <laughs> Cecil, <laughs> taking him out on walks in the middle of a show. Come on. Mm-hmm. After a two-year stream of new environments, new modes, and dozens and dozens of new cars, Forza Horizon 4 just won't stop getting bigger. The newest addition to the long list of activities crammed into, into Playground Games is open. The, the idea of just won't stop getting bigger right after I read that ad is... And, yeah, and, and like, crammed, oh. yeah. <laughs> uh, the newest addition to the long list of activities crammed into Playground's open-world racing juggernaut is the Horizon Super 7, a brand new mode that allows players to participate in custom-built racing, driving, and stunt based challenges made by other players plus the ability to create and share their own if you're thinking this sounds similar to the custom user created bucket list challenges from forza horizon 3 you're on the right track like her hmm. like forza horizon 3's custom bucket list challenges super 7's creation tools are based around a similar set of broad challenge types from skill scores challenges to pr stunts and from point to point time trials and easy cruises you can tune you can tune the season, time of day, weather, and even select the default music from Forza Horizon 4's radio stations if you wish. There are some significant differences. However, Super 7 challenges can be created uh, starting wherever you choose rather than the preset points on the map. And they can now be filled with stunt jumps, props, and other structures via a custom map editing tool. Uh, I really like Forza Horizon, Forza Horizon 4. And so when I saw this pop up yesterday, I was very excited about this. And it makes me, it's making me want to jump back in, especially now that I have the Series X version, because I haven't spent a, as much time with it as I'd like. Um, yeah. So very exciting stuff. Usually when they do a Horizon like expansion, like at the end of its life, it's, it's a hint at what Forza, the next mainline Forza game will be. So I'm guessing it's going to be like an emphasis on track creation or something. Like that would make some sense. And that, that would also mm -hmm. explain why that, next game seemingly is taking so long so like jeffy grub grub said it's like we'll see if the next forza horizon before we see the next mainline series so yeah I, that is exciting both on its own and for what we see next story number five project afia will be a ps5 console exclusive for at least two years this is jordan allman at ign the mysterious square enix game project afia will be a ps5 exclusive for at least two years a new trailer has revealed a new and upcoming games trailer was posted to the official playstation youtube account which shows footage from ps5's 2021 lineup including games like Deathloop, ratchet and clank rift apart and horizon forbidden west project Af afia uh, appears briefly and a tag underneath the footage gives gives us some more details about the game's so, the game's Sony exclusivity deal. Project Athia will be available also on PC, but it won't be available on other consoles like the Xbox family of devices for at least 24 months after 
release date. Uh, and in the the uh, tr- the PlayStation trailer, right? That's that Barrett has pulled up here. Uh, it also shows that Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo are exclusive for like twelve months, uh, yeah. exactly. And so after those twelve months, you'll see the, see that come to other consoles. I don't know if that was already public knowledge, but uh, just to keep y'all informed, boom. We knew it was go. time. I don't think we knew it was a year entirely. Okay, and so that's actually very nice to know because I imagine for both those games being Bethesda games. Probably 12 months on the dot is we can expect those on Xbox. Yeah, yeah. and that'll be the last taste of Bethesda that we see on PlayStation consoles. No, no. I Here's mm. my... If I were running it, this would be my strategy, is release Starfield on both consoles, but on Xbox, it's on Game Pass. So, like, yeah, you could pay 70 bucks for it on PS5 or just not buy on Xbox... Yeah. Or not, not even buy it on Xbox. Download it on Game Pass, and it's free. And, like, that sets up an expectation for Elder Scrolls and the rest. I'm very yeah. curious how this Bethesda At, situation works with with uh with with yeah. Microsoft. I doubt I doubt they know completely yet, but yeah, Athia, I I think Sony knows what Square's uh internal prospects are for this game because I know Square is very heavily invested in this. They want this to be the next big thing. Uh, the CEO whose name I've completely forgotten right now, and I'll think of it at some point. You he does a thing occasionally where he will have a pet project. And at one point that was Avengers, but as Avengers wasn't shaping up, he kind of moved off that. And Masuda. right now it's right now it's Athia. Yeah, what? Well, yeah, what did you say? Yosuke Masuda. Masuda, yes, I'm completely right. <laughs> the yeah, he's really focusing on Athia. As they want this to be a huge thing for them, and I think they've expressed those desires to Sony. So I imagine Sony's going to go hard on both exclusivity and also marketing for this game. Do we know anything about this game aside from that no. trailer that they showed? I don't want to speculate because I know a couple of things and I don't want to say them if they're not publicly known yet. Hmm. I will tell you. Know you know Gary Wood is working on it. Just, just so tell us, Imran. Just tell just us. Tell like, us. I, I don't, I don't Imran, know just, if they reveal the who word, the star just... is or like where this oh. game is being made or who's making it. Cause oh. Like, star. Yeah. It's like a, John it's Boyega. A, it's a known celebrity. <laughs> she was in Charlie's Angel. Like it, yeah. But oh. yes, they... Uh, mm. There are things Gal about this Gadot. game that, that Square is spending a lot of money on. And I don't very, think Gal Gadot is in things. Charlie's Angels. Bless it. <laughs> I didn't hear the Charlie's Angels part. Mm-hmm. I just heard her. And so mm-hmm. I was like, who, who's, the, who's hot right now? My, Gal my, my Gal prediction, Gadot. Kristen Stewart. Charlie's Angel? Tr- Kristen Stewart? Honestly, Kristen Stewart in a video game, I'd be, I'd be down with it. I will say I'd one thing about this game it. is this game was such a secret project for a long time is that they were telling people to mislead them that it was Final Fantasy 16, which led to a lot of confusion where people thought this game was going to be revealed at 16, including me for a while. So it's like to them, it is a big reveal and an important project. Hmm. So I, I, and also I, I believe it is is closer than people think. So we'll see. This is very exciting stuff. We shall see. Story number six, you can play as Marshawn Lynch in Predator Hunting Grounds now. This is from the PlayStation blog, uh, where they write, yes, that's right. Today, December 8th, our paid DLC pack introduces a brand new character to the Predator lore. Help us in welcoming Dante Beast Mode Jefferson, brought to life with the voice and looks of football legend Marshawn Lynch. I felt I figured that'd be a fun, a fun little story here, right? You can see there's that there he is, Barrett showing him in the video. Uh, Marshawn Lynch, of course, uh, uh, I know from uh, Seattle Seahawks. I know why I, I kept wanting to say Seattle Sounders, and I was like, I know the Sounders, not the football team. Uh, known from the Seahawks. Marshawn he was Lynch. funny in Brooklyn Nine Nine. When was there he in go. Brooklyn Nine Nine? He was in like a guest spot where like Rosa was saying he need like she was looks up to him because he's so quiet, and he mm. his joke was he just talked about everything. Kind of find com slash you're wrong. He was the one that was like. Uh, I'm only here because I'm uh, so I don't get fined, right? That was Marshawn Lynch when they were interviewing him, and like he just he didn't answer any questions. He was just like, "I'm I'm here, so I don't get fined." If so, I very much respect Marshawn Lynch and his energy. <laughs> it was either him or Richard Sherman. Um, one of those two was the one in doing that interview, and it was very good. Imran, very excited to see uh, Kristen Stewart get revealed for Project Athia, but that's just so far away. If I wanted to know what's coming out to Mom and Grab shops today, where would I look? 
The official list of upcoming software across each and every platform is listed by the kind of funny games daily show host each and every weekday. Yeah. For as a disclaimer for the reset eras out there, right? The Kristen Stewart shit is a joke. I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not serious when I think Kristen Stewart's in Project Athia. It is a. It is a. It's too late, blessing. You said it. Thing. You said it by don't itself. They're gonna clip it threads. out. <laughs> don't clip it out. Don't make your threads. Calm down, everybody. Out today, we got <laughs> Monster Sanctuary for PS4, Xbox One, Switch, PC, and Mac. Puyo Puyo Tetris 2 for PS5, PS4, Xbox Series X, slash S, Xbox One, and Switch. Destiny 2 for PS5 and Xbox Series X. Doom Eternal for Switch. Swords of Gargantua for PS4. Call of the Sea for Xbox Series X, Xbox One, and PC. And I'm going to stop there because we've got a question here from Benjamin, or not even a question. We got a write in here from Benjamin Berry, who wrote into patreon.com. So it's kind of funny games. It says, Hey, Blessing Emron. Maybe for the Out Today segment, if I were to tell you that in the same week Cyberpunk comes out, an Xbox exclusive will also come out and it will get the same score from IGN, would you know what game I was talking about? Also, would you by default think that Cyberpunk may have, must have underwhelmed? Of course, I'm talking about Call of the Sea, which got a 9 from IGN. It's of course on Game Pass. Metacritic is sitting around an 8. Not very many reviews yet. Uh, it is a first-person adventure puzzle game. And you can, you can complete it in around four to five hours. So if you have Xbox Game Pass and are waiting for Cyberpunk to release and wondering what you could play through the next couple of days, that is a game you might want to check out. Again, that is Call of the Sea. And uh, Benjamin, because of your recommendation, I'm going to download that. I want to check, check it, out. it out. I'm very into the first-person puzzle games. I li really liked Superliminal and Manifold Garden that both came to PlayStation this year. And so I'll check out Call of the Sea. Also out today, uh, we got Temtem for PS5, Lo-Fi Ping Pong for Switch, and Heroes of Loot for Switch. New dates for you. Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time remake has been delayed from January to March 18th, 2021. And I believe in the statement, they're like, yo, we want to make this game better. That, so. That's necessary, I think. Like That game would have like, been probably fine. Will but two like, months do it, though? Yeah, I was going to say, is no. two months enough <laughs> to, no. to make the upgrades that they probably want to make for the way people are, are receiving this game? Then that probably means there's something wrong with that game we haven't seen. We shall see, or or it ends up getting delayed again because they realize that two months is enough. But I don't again, think it's a big enough project that they're gonna like delay it again. I think this probably means they're gonna crunch pretty hard until March. But yeah, we'll we'll see how it goes. I w I'm excited for that game. If it does end up looking bad, I at least it'll be Prince of Persia. But I would prefer true. it to not look bad. Uh, and then also for new dates, Destiny Two crossplay is coming in 2021. Yeah, now it's time cool. for Rita Mill. You can write it in patreon.com. I feel like this, well, I was going to say I feel like that's too late, and it's definitely not because I know Destiny 2 still has a huge player base that is probably very excited about that. Uh, I wish this was a thing earlier because I would have taken advantage of this while I was playing Destiny 2. Well, the important uh, thing is that now it's on Game Pass. So with crossplay, you can yeah. just be like, yeah, I'm going to check into Destiny right now because, like, why the hell not? And play with people who have been playing the entire time on PC and PS4. Or that's actually PS4, very whatever. exciting. As yeah. a play, as a PlayStation player, right? Like if you if you just get Xbox Game Pass, you can check in on Destiny on your phone and do your dailies or whatever via XCloud or whatever. Yeah, or if you That's haven't been buying expansions, you can just be like, "I'm gonna move my save over, play it on Xbox now." Very exciting stuff. Now it is time for reader mail. You can write into patreoncom slash games where you can get the show ad free and where you can write in with your questions, just like Miko did. Miko wrote in and said, hey, Blessing Imran, after seeing a lot of craziness online yesterday over cyberpunk reviews, I have one question. Are games journalists slash content creators to blame? I feel for years now, they've been building up this game to unimaginable levels of hype from, be from behind the scenes demos, gameplay previews, etc. Not that the reviews are out, or now that the reviews are out and giving fair criticisms, in my opinion, they're feeling the backlash from the hype. Did they create this monster? Should journalists slash creators be more careful about building these type of hype, these, these hype machines behind games? Anyway, sorry for the long question. Have a great week, boys. Are journalists to blame? No. They are. No, but yes. Like, we are complicit in the hype cycle for sure. Uh, the hi Cyberpunk became hyped because of that one E3 where they showed uh, that behind closed doors demo. And like showed it to game journalists, and then they released it themselves a couple of months later. But they let those couple of months of like game journalists going, "Oh, we've seen this thing that's so amazing!" Like mm -hmm. the way they should, we should, we saw a very tightly controlled demo. And granted, it was extremely impressive, but we were definitely. If the goal was to not fall into the hype trap, then we failed. 
granted, that's not necessarily the goal. It's it's the job. It's the job is to report the things we see. But it is important for both game journalists to know and communicate, and also for the audience to understand that everything we see before a game releases is absolutely meant to be taken with a grain of salt. Is absolutely meant to be shown like, hey, they're not going to show us the buggy, incomplete version that might get played on day one. They're going to show us the very tightly controlled, spit shine polished version. Yeah, they're going to show the vision. Like they're going to show what their aim is, and their aim isn't necessarily going to be always what they hit. Right. And I think a lot of, a lot of the cyberpunk fandom, which is like, I mean, a decent part of it is because it's the guys who made Witcher Three, which is one of the top games of the generation. But like, also a lot of it is just based on the fact that those previews were glowing and. What they were saying in marketing of that game was breathlessly repeated by games journalism. Granted, it, it's, it is a factor. It is not the sole part of it, but it contributes to a lot of what's happening today. Like, uh, By the way, I, I don't think I mentioned this, but people were, who were sending videos to Leanna Rupert about, like, that were causing seizures, fuck them. Oh, yeah, fuck, fuck them. off. No, like, immediately, if, you were, if you're someone who thought about that or, like, you know, thought it was funny or didn't, didn't disapprove in any way, fuck off from here. Because that is that is assault. Get the hell out of the gaming community because we don't want you. Mm. So like the the fandom that comes around stuff like that that results in things in things like uh, a defense force that goes that crazy, then that shouldn't belong here. And I don't necessarily like I said I don't think game journalism is the only part of that, but I do think yeah we do we are complicit in the marketing. Mm-hmm. I my response to this question would be what is what do we consider overhype? Because in the situation for in the situation of, of Cyberpunk, right now it's sitting at a 91 on Metacritic, which is a which is an incredible score. Like that is something that so many games would aspire to, a 91 yeah. on Metacritic. And I think having criticisms for a game and where what a game's overall score or overall uh, reception is critically. Like those things don't necessarily have to be mutual, mutually exclusive. Where for me, coming out of Cyberpunk, like I think the game's incredible. I think the game's phenomenal. There are like, there are so many things I can point to in ways that the game uh, hooked me, in the ways that the game blew me away, in the way that certain story moments really brought me in, in the way that certain character development, again, blew me away. That also doesn't have to take away from the fact that, oh yeah, when I played this game, I experienced a bunch of bugs. Oh yeah, there are certain things that they're doing stylistically that feels. Uh, like it's leaning in towards its edginess way too much. Uh, and, and dildos doesn't... everywhere. Dildos everywhere. What's <laughs> with all the dildos? <laughs> so many dildos in the game. Uh, and <laughs> I like the idea of Greg popping in and being, and, uh, uh, having something to say about the dildo specifically because that's what I, I was expecting just now. Yeah, I, in my mind, he he popped in and then like heard dildos everywhere and left. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. If people heard the 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 um, pop in and pop out, but Greg. Just no, I, 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 I have I have that disabled. Uh, I think he accidentally okay. clicked live one, uh, and then went to live two. live two. Yeah. Um, but like you know, you there can be these criticisms, and there's there can be these these places where the game uh, uh, falls right, but that doesn't necessarily have to take away from the overall uh, uh, conversation or hype or the things that the game does that are impressive. Like these are both things that can coexist pretty easily and those are going to affect people affect people's enjoyment of the game in varying ways uh yeah. and so like when we talk about previews and people coming out of that original demo the original closed door demo of cyberpunk like it's not like anybody there was lying it's not like anybody there was like oh yeah this is incredible but like you know what they really saw wasn't that, that incredible right like it those things can be true and at the same time a final product can, can come out and then we discover all these things because cyberpunk is a game that you can play for hundreds of hours and play in so many different ways and have a bunch of different experiences with and people are going to have people are going to take away from their experience what they take away uh and so i I think that has a lot to do with where you're seeing it fall now where yeah like you're seeing reviews come out as from let's say sevens to nines and the seven review and the nine review might cite a lot of the similar things as far as like bugs and certain things but they're written in uh they're written and they're talking about a lot of other things that maybe each person didn't see because their playthroughs were so different because it's a massive game with a lot of moving parts to it. Yeah. My counter argument to like why you shouldn't just like take those things at face value though is Bioshock Infinite, which regardless of how you think of the final game, those previews are misleading as hell because that's not what the game was. Remember like, that they, first trailer? They, it was dope. That first trailer, that first preview of like her wearing like the moose helmet or mm. moose hat thing, like none of that was actually the game. It's, I mean, 
game scopes change, things change, all that. But it should also be why we as an audience should be careful. And uh, but okay, we as journalists should be careful in how we report these things. An audience should be careful in how we accept those reports. Like that should be the the sea change we see from these games. And right now it's time for kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong, where people write in, let, let us know what we got wrong as we got it wrong. Uh, let's see here. Nato Ball just says, Jeff Keeling said on Reddit that the TGAs will be 2.5 hours long, not four hours. We have it blocked out on the schedule for four hours, and I assume that has to do with like pre-show stuff. Yeah, I, I think pre-show was two hours. Yeah. Because like so, they had musical performances and all that during the pre-show. Uh... Mm-mm-mm. It always scares me when you guys go completely silent when I'm running a show because I assume yes. the Discord crashed. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why it's tough to be wrong because there's so many and like I, most of them are editorial editorializing. Uh, this is not a year wrong, but I just saw on Twitter that uh, Alfred Molina is coming to Spider Man Three. Yo, let's go, Spider Verse yeah. baby, live action Spider Verse, let's go. Is that is that confirmed? I know there was a rumor before. I think it's that's Hollywood. what THR is saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Remember when we were Barry and me, we were talking about that on like in, while playing Fortnite or something, and you said his name, and I thought you was August Alcina, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't know snap, if that was me. Like, I don't know if that was me. It might, uh, well, that, was, that was definitely you. I don't think <laughs> that was so. I didn't make the. We weren't making the August Alcina joke of like the entanglements in Spider Man that are gonna happen. Maybe that was Kevin. August Alcina. I don't even know who that is. Blessing. <laughs> oh, then I'm not somebody else then. Well, damn. Uh, people are confirming yes. Marshawn Lynch is the guy who was like, I'm here, so I find. Uh, Nanobot just mentions here that Imran said Destiny 2 was on Game Pass. While that is true, the latest expansion is also available. Uh, oh, yeah. is also available on Game Pass and doesn't need to be purchased. And so, right, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you have, yeah. if you want to play Destiny 2 with someone, you can just leap into that content. And there you go. That's it for kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. Tomorrow's hosts for Kind of Funny Games Daily are Greg Miller and Gary Witta. So ask all the Project Athia questions to him. Uh, if you're watching this live on Twitch, after this is the sponsored Halo Butterfinger stream with Greg and Snowbike Mike. So stay tuned for that. Of course, this has been Kind of Funny Games Daily, each and every weekday live right here on Twitch.tv slash Kind of Funny Games. We run you through the nerdy news you need to know about. We have a Patreon post show for those that are subbed at the silver level of Patreon.com slash Kind of Funny Games. So stick around for that. Otherwise, till next time, Game Daily. <laughs>